stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And the King James text reads in this fashion, Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Want to talk to us? It'll be brief. Sunday morning message will be a simple word of exhortation. But I want to talk to us for just a little while on the topic, Who you going to believe? Amen. Who you going to believe? Master, we thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to be in the house of God, to hear from the Word of God. Lord, today, speak to the hearts of your people. Allow us, God, today to glean some encouragement. Allow us, God, today to glean some nourishment from your Word as it would go forth. We desire the anointing of the Holy Ghost, for without the anointing, there is nothing that could be said this morning from this pulpit that would benefit anyone. But Master, today we ask that the holy presence of a living God would ride upon every word this hour and allow it to find its mark in the deepest part of the heart of the hearer, that they might not only hear but receive and believe that which they hear this hour to the salvation of their soul. Send forth your word to heal. Send forth your word to reconcile. Send forth your word to reclaim. Send forth your word to save this day. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. The NIV reads this way for those who might have a little difficulty with the King James language. John chapter 5, verses 41 through 47 in the NIV reads, You are doing the things your own father does. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and now am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet, because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? I am telling the truth. Why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. One of the most important things that you need to understand about what I've read this morning from the Word of the Lord, John chapter 5, verses 41 through 47, one of the most important things for you to understand about this passage today, the words themselves are very important, and the words themselves uh, carry a very powerful message. 
But there is something that is very important that I think a lot of people tend to overlook when they read this passage of Scripture. And what they overlook is this, Jack. Jesus was speaking at that moment in time to the scribes and Pharisees. He was speaking to church folks. He was speaking to religious folks. He was speaking to folks who had a lot of time clocked in at the temple and had a lot of education, who were supposed to be enlightened, who were supposed to have a whole depth of spirituality about them. These were not a bunch of sinner folks outside of the church that the Lord was talking to. These were a bunch of church people. My Lord have mercy. Well, preacher, I don't understand how that changes anything. It changes everything. Because there are a lot of people in our community this morning who are outside of God's church and they're outside of the fellowship of God's people because of some stupidity that come out of the mouth of somebody in the church house. Hello now. That come out of the mouth of some preacher. Or come out of the mouth of somebody who calls himself a prophet. Uh huh. Preach it. My Lord have mercy. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, not everybody in church belongs to God. Hello Amen. now. Not everybody in the church of God serves the God of the church. Amen. Amen. And it's a sad reality for me that so many in our world today, not just in the GOBT community, even outside of the GOBT community, so many are outside of church and they're away from God because of something that was said or done uh -huh. by someone who should have known better. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. See, the scribes and Pharisees had all the education in the things of God that was available to them at that time. Uh -huh. And I've got news for you. It wasn't a month's worth of internship somewhere. No, they spent years and years and years studying and preparing themselves. And yet for all that knowledge, they still couldn't hear from God. Oh, folks, who are you going to believe? You see, we tend to look at the wrong people, and we tend to believe the wrong people. We tend to hear something come out of this person's mouth, and because they got high hair and long sleeves and long skirts, we assume they're where, where they ought to be with God. Am I telling the truth now? Amen. We tend to think, well, because the pastor said it, it must be so. Hello now. Uh -huh. And yet Jesus is saying to those who claim to represent God, who claim to know God, who claim and believe in the depth of their heart that they have a relationship with God and they know more about God than the average man on the street. And yet Jesus says to them, you are the sons of the devil. Your God is not your father. Your father is not the God of heaven. You, if he were your father, you'd understand and accept and approve of every word that comes off my lips. Uh -huh. But instead, you rebel against it. Instead, you rebuff it. Instead, you push it away. Every time I make a statement, you're pushing against what I have to say rather than receiving it gladly. He said, well, I've got news for you. There's a reason why you do that. Uh -huh. And it's not because you were born illegitimately. It's because you have a daddy, all right. But it ain't the daddy you claim. Hello now. Right. I want to tell you, church world, I want to tell you, backslider. I want to tell you disenfranchised, discouraged one. I want to tell you, GLBT person who once shouted in the aisles of God's church and rejoiced at the name of Jesus. I want to tell you today, there are a lot of devils and children of devils that occupy the pews of God's church. And if you let them push you out, and if you let them push you away, and if you let them dissuade you and discourage you, then my friend, you have fallen right into the devil's trap and you're exactly where he wants you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's right. 
But now I'm going to challenge our people today. I get so sick and tired. Boy, I tell you, I get absolutely sick and tired of hearing the same excuse over and over and over again for GLBT people living like a fool, living like a dog, and I hear over and over again on the internet and in person, you know, well, but as a people, we've been so hurt by the church. Well, you know, we've been so hurt by the church. That's why when we finally start coming to church, we act like a bunch of idiots and we don't know how to conduct ourselves. Even though I was raised in church, even though I know the right way to live, and I know the right way to walk, and I know the right way to talk, and I know how to live morally, and I know how to live godly, and I know how to live right. Even though I know all that, I still act the fool when I come into a, an affirming work. all because, well, I've been hurt so bad. Get tired of it. It's foolishness. I'm going to tell you right now. I didn't have a wonderful journey when it came to my coming out experience. I had a rough road, honey. I had a rough experience. And uh, I had moved to Austin, Texas. Decided I wanted to be part of a what amounts to a mega church down there that was pastored by a man that to this day I can honestly say I believe was a good man and I still believe he's a good man and he preaches a good message and he wasn't all bogged down with the hair makeup and jewelry like some in our movement mainstream movement can be and he'd been put out of the UPC because, God forbid, you get on television and preach the oneness doctrine and the good news of Acts 2.38. God forbid you do that. So he'd been knocked out of the UPC. And everybody you talked to who was part of the UPC, when they'd mention his name, boy, they'd mention it with a snarl. They'd mention it with a nasty word. They'd have a bad attitude about him because after all, he was just the devil. He was just evil because he left the UPC, bless God, and God knows that no godly, holy, righteous, good people ever leave the UPC. God forbid. So I had been going through a very difficult time in my third church that I started, which was my first apostolic work. And I was having a very difficult time because a nearby apostolic church decided they wanted to demonize me because they didn't want another apostolic church within 20 miles of their church. They had the market cornered and had had the market cornered for many, 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 many years. And the pastor was afraid that if there was another apostolic church within 20 miles, that he'd lose people. I'm not, I, I got so many thoughts coming in my head relative to that, but I'm not going to go into none of that. The people would just do what God called them to do, do the work God called them to do. They wouldn't have to worry about it. If people leave, God will bring others. That's right. If the Lord wants them in your church, then they'll be in your church. If they need to be there, they'll be there. I don't care where people. Somebody comes in this church and we baptize them in Jesus' name and they get the Holy Ghost and tomorrow they decide to go down to First UPC and join the church and serve the Lord there. Hallelujah anyhow. Amen. But see, we're too busy nowadays worried about building our own churches instead of God's church. We're worried about our own reputations. We're worried about our own incomes. We're worried about our own salaries. We're worried about our own attendance. We're worried about our own numbers. We're worried about our own statistics. And instead of being about the Father's business, we're in business for ourselves. But that's all I'll say on that. So I've gone through a very hard time. Anybody that knows anything about certain groups of people, if you're not part of their little group, they'll demonize you and they'll, they'll just paint you the most evil, wicked person that ever walked on planet Earth. And that's what happened. So when I decided to go to Austin, I identified with that pastor. See, I understood what he was going through. But he was so successful 
in bringing the oneness message to so many people that I felt that I could benefit from his ministry. You know, it's so sad when preachers in today's world are so full of pride and ego that they don't think for one minute, brother, they can benefit from somebody else's ministry. Right. There's a lot of preachers. They don't think for one second that they might need to step down from their pulpit and get in a church somewhere for a while. Mm -hmm. That that might be the best thing they could ever do for themselves. There are people trying to pass the works right here in Dallas that don't need to be in the pulpit. They need to be in the pew. Uh -huh. They have no business standing in God's pulpit. God never called them to preach. God never told them to preach. It's like the book of Jeremiah. The Lord said, I have not sent them, yet they ran. I have not spoken, and yet they said, Thus saith the Lord. A lot of people, folks, in ministry today who have no business being in ministry. God didn't call them, and if God didn't call you, I've got news for you. God don't equip anybody he hasn't called. You have no business, and our, our community suffers for it, suffers greatly for it, because there's a lot of unqualified leadership out there leading people, in, and many times they, all they can offer the people is milk because that's all they can swallow. Amen. Amen. A lot of the leadership is so weak spiritually and so watered down and compromised spiritually, they can't put out anything they don't have on the inside. And the people of God in the GLBT communities are suffering today for the untold multitudes of uncalled, unanointed, unequipped leaders that we have out there claiming to be pastors and preachers and prophets, etc., etc., etc. So anyway, here I was pastoring a church. We were having a hard time because of this other church wanting to demonize us, but we had folks coming. We had folks paying tithes. We could easily pay our bills. We didn't have any problem financially because of that other church. And honestly, I look back sometimes and wonder if maybe I didn't even miss the Lord. Because I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be perfect. I don't claim every decision I've ever made was right. It was just what I thought and believed was right, at least for that time. But I learned about this pastor down in Austin. And I went down and visited his church. And I even preached for him one time. And I got up and preached in front of 5,000 people. And boy, howdy, that was the biggest crowd I'd ever preached in front of. And I was scared to death just for the sheer number of people. But I'll tell you, those people loved the Word of God. He had a big church, but he had people that loved the Word of God. They shouted, brother. <laughs> they shouted. They got happy. They believed God for miracles. We laid hands on a lady in a wheelchair and watched her get up and walk out of that wheelchair. Oh, I'm telling you, it's a mega church, but it was a Jesus' name church where they believed in the power of Jesus' name, where they believed in Acts 2.38 salvation, where they believed in the power of the Holy Ghost. And when I talked to that pastor in his office before I preached for him, because he was a smart pastor, he didn't just let anybody get up in his pulpit and preach. He had to meet with you personally before he did it. And he met with me in his office and talked with me. And he said, brother, he said, I've got to tell you, he said, my wife and I have been in Austin, Texas at this time. Now, this was many years back, back in 1989 to be exact. He said, we've been in Austin, Texas, I believe at that time, he said, for 17 years. He said, we've been here 17 years. We started our church 17 years ago. He said, and in the last 17 years, the badge of honor that I'm able to wear today, the trophy that I'm able to put on my shelf, the thing that makes me the proudest and the happiest for all those years of labor, he said, in 17 years, we've baptized 25,000 people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And tears were in his eyes as he said it. And I knew right then that his heart and my heart were in the same place. See, he didn't care about how many church members he had. 
He wasn't bragging about how many folks come to church. He wasn't bragging about the building they built. He wasn't bag bragging about how many buses they had or how many Sunday school classes they had. He was bragging about how many people found Jesus and found the truth and embraced it and obeyed it. That's what made him happiest. And I knew right then that Brother Phillips, I'll say his name, Kenneth Phillips, and I were on the same page. And I preached for him. We had a wonderful service. God moved. Wonderful time. Well, a couple of weeks later, one of the reasons I went to Austin, I was constantly trying to suppress what I felt internally. And I had already been through my marriage with Stacy, and I was legally divorced. And I felt like I was condemned to a life of loneliness because as a divorced man, I was never going to be ordained, you know, because most of the churches in the Pentecostal movement will not ordain a divorced man. Even though she and I had not ever consummated our marriage before God, that didn't matter. Because after all, folks, what matters to God matters little to the church. Hello now. So anyway, I was very lonely trying desperately to suppress this gay issue that I was dealing with, trying terribly hard to suppress this gay issue. And there was a young lady that I had begun to communicate with down in Austin. And uh, I went to Austin to meet her and spend some time with her. She was UPC. And I went down and met her and spent some time with her. And she seemed like a nice, sweet girl. And her parents attended Brother Phillips Church, but she didn't. And boy, I'm telling you, there was so much tension in that household, all because her parents attended Brother Phillips Church. Didn't matter what the man preached. All that mattered is he's no longer part of the UPC. So he, he can't be any good. And that's all I heard from her, was how lousy and evil and horrible Brother Phillips was. Because he left the UPC and he wasn't part of the UPC over the issue of television. Hallelujah, glory to God. So anyway, I told her folks what I was going through up in East Texas. And they were excited about me and their daughter, you know, possibly being an item and all that. And they knew my situation as far as being married, you know, and divorced and all that. And uh, they told me, said, well, if you would ever think of coming down this way, so you and this girl, I won't say her name, but so that you and this girl can pursue your relationship, you know, more. They said, we'd be happy to help you to relocate and all that. So after a while, I decided, I said, Lord, because I kept praying, and I don't like fighting my own people. I can't stand fighting my own people. But you know what? Without fail, I don't care where I go in ministry. I don't care what I do. Without fail, that's exactly what winds up happening. Without fail. And it uh, hadn't been any different since I've been in affirming ministry. I've had more people in our own community, in our own movement come against me than I have in the mainstream, it feels like. So I kept praying. I said, God, I hate fighting my own people. I love this local pastor who was, you know, just down the road away from us. And I've been in his church for a year and a half or so, two years, and been a faithful member. And he knew me and I knew him. And I couldn't understand why he would let people in his congregation talk about me and say all these negative, evil things about me. All because we went up the road 20 miles and we're trying to start a church. And that was the only reason. And so I was getting weary with this. And I was only at the time 24 years old. Going to be 20. I was 23. Going to be 24. And I was getting so weary with that whole struggle. And I prayed. I said, Lord, I believe I'm going to resign this church. I'm going to give it up. I said, and I'm going to move to Austin. And I'm going to get under Brother Phillips, and I'm going to learn from him, because somehow, some way, he's found a way to very effectively communicate this gospel to many people, and I want to be as effective as he is. So I want to learn from him. I want to get under him and learn from him. I want to be, in my exact words, where I want to be uh, Timothy to his Paul for a while. 
See, a lot of preachers don't think they need to ever spend any time in Timothy's shoes. They think, no, I'm Paul, bless God. I'm as good as Paul is. That's why we get all these full preachers running around calling themselves apostles. Because I'm, I'm everything Paul was. Baloney you are. You wish you were. And I'll tell you what, folks. I just got so tired. I said, Lord, I feel like I want to go to Austin. That will give me an opportunity to pursue my relationship with this girl. That will give me an opportunity to, to learn from Brother Phillips and be in his church and be part of that. So I made arrangements with this girl's parents to stay with them for a while and go to Austin and do all this. So I put my brother who was living with me at the time in the care of a family from the church that I had been a member of, the one that was giving me all this grief. But this particular family had always been supportive of me and they never changed. There were many in that church who knew me and loved me and supported me regardless of what was going on you know, with the others in the church. So I asked them, I said, while I'm making the transition and doing what I have to do, can you please keep my brother with you for a couple weeks? Would that be all right? And they said yes. So I went down to Austin, got a job selling cars at a local dealership. And in short order, the girl that I was pursuing, her attitude began to change. And she began to get real caustic with me, real sarcastic and nasty. And uh, her parents came to me and said, and I'm just going to tell you honestly what they said. Her parents came to me and said, her best friend is trying to tell her that you're not for her and you're, you're the wrong guy and you're not the right one for her. And we believe that this best friend of hers is a lesbian and that she's trying to get to her and that every fellow that comes along, she's trying to dissuade her. You know, no, he's not for you, he's not for you, he's not for you. Well, both of these girls in plain English were enormous, were very large girls including the girl I was pursuing. She was a great, big, very large girl. And uh, low self-esteem, you know how that works. And uh, so anyway, this is what the parents told me, but they kept saying to me, you know, hang in there because we really feel like, you know, you and her have a future and blah, blah, blah. So hang in there, don't give up on her, you know. So I was trying real hard, but like everything else in my life, it just seemed like everything I tried to do was hard. You know, everything I tried, nothing would just go easy. It always had to be hard. <sighs> Finally, one night I spoke to my brother on the phone, and I can't at all remember what happened in terms of the conversation, but there was something he said that, I found kind of hurtful. I don't remember what it was, but I hung up the phone and I said something about my brother said thus and so, and, and I said, and I, I don't know why, I can't remember, but it kind of hurt my feelings. And uh, this girl made a real nasty, real sarcastic, real just unnecessary comment in response to what I said. And it just hit me so wrong at that minute. I was such a lonely kid. I, all I wanted was somebody to love me and somebody I could love and I, that, you know, that would love me back. And I didn't care about what she looked like. I didn't care about nothing. I just thought if I had a woman, that would fix everything. And you know, if I were married, that would fix everything and everything would be all right. And I was trying so hard to do, quote, the right thing. And when she, this night, when she said this to me, I just got so aggravated, I remember leaving the house, and I got in my car, and I drove up the road, and I drove past an adult bookstore. Now, I never hardly even, I don't think I'd ever been in an adult bookstore in my life, hardly. <laughs> uh, if I had been, I don't remember, but anyway, before this happened, I don't believe I'd ever been in an adult bookstore. But I saw this adult bookstore, and I passed it. And I was praying, and I'm saying, Lord, you know, I'm so tired, I'm so lonely, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing, I'm, I'm trying to kill this, this queer devil in me, and I'm trying, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, and nothing I'm doing is working. And then finally, I drove past that store, I come back, and drove past it again, probably on the third time or so, I decided I'd stop and go in. So I stopped and I went in, 
And I saw some gay porn and all that around, and of course, it appealed to me at some level. But I, I've never really been one to get into all that, so I found some magazines. Back, this is pre-internet days. I found some magazines that offered advertising, you know, people looking for love and all that kind of stuff. It was, but it, they were gay oriented. And I said, well, bless God, you know what? If she's going to act like that and everything. I'm just tired of this. I'm, I'm just going to find me somebody. I'm just, just going to be who I am and just find me somebody and call it a day. And I'm tired of all this, you know, kind of in that frame of mind. So I proceeded then to buy a couple of these uh, dating magazines or whatever you want to call them and uh, brought them home. And I hid them very carefully in a bag that I carried to work back and forth with me. And I had that bag so tight with, uh, I was selling Fords, and I had all kind of Ford flyers for all our different models of cars and everything in case I was out and about because I'm a consummate salesman. And if I meet somebody and say, well, I'm thinking about buying a Ford, I'll go to the trunk of my car, pull out the flyer and say, well, here, what, which car are you interested in? And have the flyer, and of course, stapled each flyer was one of my business cards. So I had this bag literally packed tight with these things. If you turned it upside down, they wouldn't have fallen out because literally it was packed that tight. And I shoved these magazines down in this bag with all those others. And I went to work the next day or two and I actually called on a couple of the ads and the people would call me back and I'd give them my work number. And they'd call me back at work and I'd answer the phone and brother, I'd be so terrified that I'd be shaken like a leaf had these guys calling me back and and I wound up just scaring out of doing anything. I, I wouldn't even meet them, you know, I'd just talk to them for a few minutes and I'd be, I'd be too scared to even meet them, so I just wouldn't. I had a very, it was, it was a scary time in my life because I knew if I followed through, you know, that I'd be stepping into a whole new field. <sighs> well, after a couple of days, I went through one of my repentance sessions and I said, oh God, I'm so sorry, Lord, I'm so sorry, I can't believe I allowed myself to buy those magazines, I can't believe, Lord, that I, I did that, oh Jesus, I'm so sorry, God, Lord, if you'll just let me live, I'll, I'll take them and throw them away, and I literally came home from work this night, I'd just gotten paid, I had my paycheck in my wallet, and I come home from work, hadn't even cashed my check. And the whole ride home, I was just repenting and apologizing to God and crying out for mercy, oh heavens. And begging God, I said, tomorrow when I go to work, I'll take these magazines and I'll throw them in the dumpster at work. Because I didn't dare throw them out of the house, you know. I said, I'll throw them out in the dumpster at work. Well, that night, I went to bed and I had a certain amount of peace because I made up my mind I was going to do, quote, the right thing, you know. And I went to bed, had a great deal of peace, and about midnight or so, a knock came at the front door. And the man of the house, the girl I was trying to see, her dad, got up and answered the door. And he comes into the, the family room where I'm on a sofa bed, and he says, Chuck, there's some men at the door asking for you. I said, asking for me? He said, yes. He said, they're police. I said, police? Well, the first thought that went through my head is, oh, Jesus, something happened to my brother, my baby brother up in East Texas. And I jumped up and I ran to the door and I wasn't wearing but pajamas and a, and a, I don't remember if I had a t-shirt on or not, I think I did. And uh, I went to the door and I had no shoes on or anything and I said, what's wrong? What, what's going on? Are you so-and-so? Yes. Turn around, put your hands behind your back. Next thing I know, they're putting handcuffs on me. There were about five police cars. All the lights are going. It looked like I was an axe murderer who had finally been caught up with. Put your hands. I started shaking like a leaf. I was so scared. I didn't had no idea what was happening. Had no idea why it was happening. They take me to the police car. They put me. I kept saying, "What? What? What? What is this? What is this about? What's happening?" And nobody would tell me. Nobody would tell me anything. I had no idea. They carted me off to jail and booked me. And I kept asking, why am I here? What am I here for? Nobody would tell me. 
I tried to call this family that I was staying with, and of course from jail you have to call collect, you know. And uh, at first he answered the phone, and I said, I don't know what I'm here for, I don't know what's going on, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, but by the next morning I tried to call, and he wouldn't even answer, he wouldn't even take my call, the father of this house. But I kept trying and trying. Every time I had an opportunity, I'd try to call, try to call. Well, after about two or three days sitting in jail, having no idea why I'm there, literally, no idea at all, he finally answers the phone one time and said, I don't want you calling this house anymore, you effing faggot. We found out you're an effing queer. This is a Pentecostal man. Jesus' name, one God man. I don't want you around my kids. I don't want you around my wife. I don't want you around my daughter. We found out what you are.